Let me welcome you to worship today at Cove Presbyterian. I'm glad that you're here where I will be reading some selections from the book of Job and preaching a sermon called Book of the Year. Listen now for the word of God. There once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Moving to the second chapter, one day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord God. And the Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to the Satan, Where have you come from? The Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to the Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then the Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to the Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So the Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. And then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job said to her, You speak as any foolish person would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. John Grisham's newest novel, A Time for Mercy will be released on Tuesday of this week. I've had the privilege of reading the book, and it is one of John's finest. But I'm sorry, Mr. Grisham. I need to nominate another book for the 2020 Book of the Year. It is the Book of Job. Yes, I know that the book of Job was not written in 2020, but it sure could have been. Its pages are filled with tragedy and pandemics, fake friends with faux compassion, and enough questions about God and faith and life to fill the Grand Canyon. Sound like 2020 to you? The character I understand best in this long, puzzling fable is certainly not Job. And it is definitely not God. The character I understand best is the adversary in Hebrew, or in English, the Satan. But before you start looking for horns, a pitchfork, a man dressed in red waiting to escort his next victim into hell... Let me introduce you to the Satan in the book of Job. In this ancient story, the Satan is a prestigious member of God's divine counsel. He is the divine prosecuting attorney. And he has an attitude. 
As the story opens, the Satan has both a problem with God and a problem with Job. He has no patience with God's naive trust in Job's goodness. And he has no trust in Job's naive patience with the goodness of God. If you were to ask the Satan if Job is a good man, he would say, yes, of course he is. But he would also say, Job is a good man because God has treated him with kid gloves. Job has been showered with blessings and has been spared the miseries of life. Enjoying a life with God's preferential treatment, who wouldn't be a good person? So as the story unfolds, the Satan makes a friendly bet with his boss. A bet on just how good Job really is. Yes, you heard me correctly. In this troubling tale, the great God, creator of heaven and earth, sovereign over all life, places a bet with the Satan. This is surely not the God who makes me want to bow down in prayer or to stand up and sing glory to God, God's behavior here is deeply disturbing and an absolute puzzlement. And Job's behavior is no less puzzling. He is unlike anyone I have ever known. The story opens, once upon a time, a man in the land of Uz. Go to your Google map. And try to find us. It might point you to southern Jordan or southern Israel. But I suspect us is right next door to Oz. Or to Hogwarts. Or to Eden. Us is Eden unspoiled. A garden of constant delight where there are no bad days. And there is beauty around every corner and abundance of everything you could ever want or need. Well, that is true until God and the Satan decide to bet, to place a bet on Job. God gives the Satan considerable leeway to make Job's idyllic life absolutely miserable. Job's fortune is destroyed, his children die. And the Satan inflicts him with sores all over his body. Yet despite a flood of calamity, Job does not rail against God, at least not at first. Sounding like someone just too good to be true, Job tells his wife, Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? I find that kind of piety maddening. As if God spends each day devising new and harder tests for us and tempting us until we finally succumb. The story, though, has just begun. It goes on for 40 long chapters. Eventually, even in the blissful land of us, Job hits his breaking point as his so-called friends arrive to explain that his suffering has nothing to do with God, but everything to do with how Job has disobeyed God. Those of us reading the story know better. We know that the opening line from Job is absolutely true. There once was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, The man was blameless and upright who feared God and turned away from evil. We know that when his friends say, you are getting your just desserts, Job, for disobeying God, that in fact, that is not only bad theology, it is a bold-faced lie. Readers of this story know that there is nothing fair about what Job is suffering. He is not having an unfortunate string of bad luck. He is being targeted 
by God and God's betting partner, the Satan. Now, lest your blood pressure get too high, remember this is a fable, not a history report. So, why did the story of Job make the final cut and end up as one of the 66 books in the Bible? And even more pressing a question, why give it any airtime in such depressing and divisive and devastating times as these? Why not move along to John's gospel and let Jesus soothe our souls with the troubling affirmation, for God so loved the world? Why not race to Paul's letter to Rome in which he opines that there is not anything in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why drop in on Job? And why today? What may sound even more confusing to you is that I love the book of Job. I love the way that it turns simplistic piety on its head. I love the way it pushes me to ask life's most important, complex theological questions and not to settle for simple and surface answers. In many ways, Job is the anti-Deuteronomy book of the Bible. In the book of Deuteronomy, life and a life of faith is plain and clear. If you live a righteous life, God will treat you right. If you live a disobedient life, God will curse you. Plain and clear. The book of Job challenges Deuteronomy's theological math. Job is righteous. He does not do any evil. He does not disrespect God no matter what his so-called friends claim. He defends God beyond all reasonable points. And yet, Job suffers enormous, unjustified, inexplicable, and intentional evil. So why in the world did ancient rabbis insist that the book of Job be included in Hebrew scripture? And why did the Christian church adopt it? And why do I love this book? Because this ancient tale raises honest questions, hard questions about God and about faith that believers fear to speak or have been taught not to speak. After watching Jerusalem burn and its youngest citizens force march into Babylonian captivity, the questions in Job came to mind. After Jesus was betrayed at dinner by one whom he had trusted and loved, And then denied three times by the disciple to whom he had entrusted the most. The questions raised in Job came to mind. As children, women, gays, gypsies, and the elderly climbed out of boxcars and into gas chambers in Dachau. The questions raised in Job came to mind. As churches were bombed in the south, and as bullets, fire hoses, and nooses had their violent way with our African American kin, the questions raised in Job came to mind. As I have slept, in night shelters with guests who have lost their jobs and homes and all hope, the questions raised in Job have come to mind. As I have stood with those who couldn't find a job or get a mortgage 
because their skin color or sexuality was different from mine. The questions raised in Job have come to mind. As the phone rang a few weeks ago, and I learned that one of the finest pastors I have ever known had died from COVID while national leaders continued to exist, insist that this is nothing more than the flu. The questions raised by Job have come to mind. Author Jonathan Kozel went to worship with a neighborhood family from one of the poorest sections of the Bronx one evening. Standing in the pulpit, the pastor spoke words of hope to parents whose children were behind bars. After the pastor spoke, Kozel wrote on his bulletin, So where is he? What is he waiting for? Come on, God. Let's get moving. I love the book of Job because it is one book in the Bible that causes me and the words of the Apostle Paul to put away childish ways of thinking about God. It is a story that invites us to sit in silence before the awesome mystery of God and the oftentimes confounding unfairness and inequities of life. Throughout my ministry, I have been told by those who have no use for the church. Gary, I do not need to be around people who think they know all the answers and have no interest in my questions. If you or anyone you know can be numbered in that crowd, Maybe Job is your doorway into the church. Maybe Job is the church's doorway into a life together where all questions are honored. Every doubt is respected. Divine mystery is embraced. And holy answers arise from the ash heap of suffering and pain. Yes, this is one book that I can never put down. Amen. And friends, now go into this world that God so loves to be makers of peace and justice. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.
Jesus come.